I'm Alan Hoffer, the director of the Traumatic Brain Injury Center at University Hospitals of Cleveland, and this is the Congress of Neurological Surgeons Neurosurgery 100. Today, we're going to be talking about diffuse traumatic brain injury. Traumatic brain injury is a major cause of death and disability in the United States. It's estimated that there are 1.5 million head injuries annually, resulting in over 200,000 hospitalizations and 60,000 deaths. Common causes include falls, firearm-related injuries, motor vehicle collisions, and assault. Nearly 5.3 million Americans live with permanent traumatic brain injury-related disability. Worldwide, it's estimated that 69 million traumatic brain injuries occur annually, with higher incidences of traffic-related injuries. When discussing traumatic brain injuries, it's important to remember that the primary physical injury is followed by a secondary biological injury. And this secondary biological injury can be extremely damaging to the brain. It can be focal, multifocal, or diffuse. The biological injury consists of a cellular and molecular cascade. This can include excitotoxicity, or uncontrolled release of excitatory neurotransmitters, loss of normal transmembrane potentials, free radical production, mitochondrial dysfunction, uncontrolled calcium release with activation of apoptotic mechanisms, opening of the blood-brain barrier with cytokine influx, loss of cerebral autoregulation, and cellular swelling. Many of these things occur at the cellular level and contribute to the underlying clinical change. Here we see a graph of glutamate release following an injury. Glutamate is the primary excitatory neurotransmitter within the brain. This glutamate release results in uncontrolled depolarization of the brain. This has many effects across the downstream cells. Normal intracellular potassium concentrations are decreased as potassium leaks out into the extracellular space. Without the appropriate energy driving ATPase related pumps, the cells remain in a depolarized state. Intracellular calcium and free radical production can impair mitochondrial dysfunction and worsen the metabolic crisis. Without oxygen, cells go into anaerobic metabolism, decreasing the amount of energy available to restore normal function. This is reflected in the lactate to pyruvate ratio within cells. The excitotoxic event is really the herald of the oncoming metabolic crisis, and we can see increased lactate to pyruvate ratios following the excitotoxic event. This loss in membrane potentials and normal transmembrane ion gradients results in cellular swelling, which can contribute to both local and global edema and brain compression. The end result of this process is cellular damage with glycerol release from the extracellular membranes. This is visible on a tissue level where we can see local hypoxia and cerebral edema. Here we can see a probe that's been placed into the brain next to an epidural hematoma. This local pressure results in increased lactate to pyruvate ratio and some ischemia, and a concomitant increase in glycerol levels. In this case, this is a focal process. And measurements from the contralateral side of the brain are within normal limits. Here, glycerol remains normal. Once the burden of injury reaches a significant level, it can result in gross organ dysfunction. And this can include intracranial hypertension, hypoperfusion, and global hypoxia, resulting in clinical changes. Our skulls contain our brain, and so this is a fixed space. Initially, small changes in volume of the brain don't result in large changes in pressure within the head. But as intracranial swelling increases, small changes in the volume of the brain can result in significant changes in intracranial pressure. Keeping in mind that our cerebral perfusion pressure is equal to our mean arterial pressure minus the intracranial pressure, that means that increasing intracranial pressure can decrease cerebral perfusion. When we look at the phenomenon of intracranial pressure, we note the presence of plateau waves that occur when pressure inside the head is high. And the plateau Lundberg A waves are the ones most associated with brain injury. Looking at the physiology of these, we can see that as intracranial pressure increases, cerebral perfusion pressure drops, and the body's response to that is to raise the systemic arterial pressure. This increases the cerebral perfusion pressure, 
and improves the intracranial hypertension. When we correlate this to the molecular phenomena in the body, we can see again that as ICP goes up and CPP goes down, available cerebral glucose also goes down, and the lactate level goes up. This occurs concomitantly with the glutamate spike. How this plays out when looking at the whole brain, we can see here. So we can look at a global model of cerebral edema. So normally, our cerebral pressures, intracranial pressures, are less than 20. And when we have globally increased pressure, these can result in bilateral force vectors causing herniation across the tentorium and into the midbrain. This can affect the ascending fibers from the reticular activating system and impair consciousness. There can also be focal brain compression, like we see here, with a unilateral source of pressure. This can result in both subfalcian herniation uh, or transtentorial herniation, and again, affect the ascending uh, fibers from the reticular activating system, as well as injuring the contralateral or uninjured side of the brain. Both of these can result in impaired consciousness as the midbrain uh, is injured. This is also how we get a dilated pupil as the expanding brain compresses the third cranial nerve going to the eye. In evaluating diffuse brain injuries, we want to start always with the ABCs of trauma. We need to make sure that the patient has an airway, that they are oxygenating their blood, and maintaining adequate systemic blood pressure. Specific to the neurologic exam, it's important to note a Glasgow Coma Score, which is based on the patient's best motor, best verbal, and best eye-opening responses. It's also very important to have a good pupillary exam. The Glasgow Coma Scale is a scale from 3 to 15 that looks at the best eye-opening, best verbal, and best motor responses. The most important of these is the motor response. A patient gets six for following commands. If they are purposeful or localizing to noxious stimuli, they get five. Withdraw to pain uh, is a score of four. Decorticate or flexor posturing is three. Decerebrate or extensor posturing is two. And a flaccid patient gets a one. It's important to distinguish a cranial response from a spinal reflex, as this can lead to an inaccurate assessment of the patient's degree of injury. Looking at this radiographically, we can detect features of focal pathology, such as fractures, cerebral contusions, extraaxial hematomas, intraventricular hemorrhage, hydrocephalus, and stroke. Trying to determine whether or not there are changes in pressure, some imaging may show signs of brain compression, such as intraparenchymal edema, shift or herniation, and cisternal effacement. Two commonly used radiographic scales to help quantify this include the Marshall classification and the Rotterdam classification. Here we have some common patterns of diffuse brain injury. Here we can see a traumatic subarachnoid hemorrhage. Trauma is the most common cause of subarachnoid hemorrhage, with ruptured aneurysm being the most common cause of non-traumatic subarachnoid hemorrhage. These hemorrhages occur along the convexities and the basal, frontal, and temporal lobes. And here we can see a nice example of the classic coup contra coup pattern, where the brain is rattling around inside the skull. Cerebral contusions are post-traumatic intraparenchymal hemorrhages. They can be single or multifocal, and commonly they're in the frontal or temporal lobes. They may not cause herniation or elevated intracranial pressure, and the blood will resolve, but the underlying neurologic injury may be severe. Here we see an example of multifocal cerebral contusions in the frontal and temporal lobes. Diffuse cerebral edema. This can be multifocal or diffuse swelling, and can be associated with herniation syndromes, such as subfalcian herniation, which can appear as midline shift, transtentorial or uncle herniation, or cerebellar or tonsillar herniation. Cisternal effacement may precede compression of critical brain structures. Here on the left, we see an initial head CT of an injured patient, and then following clinical deterioration, a repeat CT was obtained that shows loss of the basal or cisterns as the diffuse cerebral edema has squeezed the spinal fluid out of the way. Diffuse axonal injury is a shearing injury where axons are severed at the gray-white junction following a trauma. 
Central nervous system axons do not regenerate, so these injuries can be profoundly disabling. That being said, rescuing damaged axons can result in significant improvement in patient outcomes. Invasive monitoring may also be used in the management and treatment of these patients. Intracranial pressure can be monitored with a fiber optic intraparenchymal probe, or a ventriculostomy can be used to monitor intracranial pressure. This has the benefit of also draining spinal fluid and decreasing the ICP. Regarding ICP monitoring, the current Brain Trauma Foundation guidelines did not find sufficient data for evidence-based recommendations on indications for placement of an ICP monitor. Regarding brain oxygenation monitoring, the ongoing BOOST trials are meant to determine if these significantly improve patient outcomes. Management of intracranial hypertension will be discussed in another talk, but a quick review of this can be found in the management algorithm from the CBIC group from 2020. Aggravating factors for traumatic brain injuries include hypotension, hypoxia, and fever. All of these may contribute to cellular energy crisis and worsening of the biological injury. In conclusion, it's important to remember that the primary physical injury can be significantly worsened by a secondary biological injury. These injuries are often multifocal or diffuse and can have significant impact on patient outcomes. These patients must be carefully monitored for signs of increased intracranial pressure and herniation syndromes. Thank you.